1. I was living in Tbilisi a few years ago, the capital of the Republic of Georgia, running a kind of legally ambiguous consumer credit operation. When I figured it was time, I took a much-needed weekend getaway in a nearby small town. The town I settled on is an extremely popular tourist location given its beautiful location along a river, nestled in a deep valley and rife with ancient churches. With many options for potential great houses, hotels, and rentals, I decided to not book in advance and to just traipse around until I found something appropriate. I found a very adequate guest house perched on a hill, with about one acre plot. Upon entering the guest house, I was greeted in typical Georgian fashion by an incredibly hospitable woman in her 60s to 90s. Hyperbole, but former Soviet Union is like that aging-wise. And her son, who was in his 30s, who resumed his yard work of filling a large hole he said was a septic tank, with a foul lingering smell after a brief introduction. Again in typical Georgian fashion, the hostess offered me tea, homemade wine, bread and cheese, all of which were much needed and fantastic. I'm an American, but my family came from Eastern Europe, so I speak Russian, as most Georgians do, so we were able to chat a lot. Our conversation progressed from basic get-to-know-you bits to more personal information like whether I am seeing anyone and who I am dating, which does come up in surprising frequency when you meet sweet grandmothers who want you to meet their granddaughters. At the time, I was dating a fellow expat from a Western European country. When I told the hostess that I was seeing someone, she seemed thrilled and asked me to show her a photo. She reacted with, ah, and nodded in approval, commenting on her physique in a way that would probably be inappropriate if it wasn't a cute old grandma. I was then pressed by the hostess as to why I didn't invite her, and how that isn't what a good boyfriend would do. Put on the spot like this, I lied and said she was very busy with a work project. She wasn't, but would be arriving later in the evening. Didn't ask. The hostess was elated by this news and called over her son and asked me to show the photo of the girl I was seeing. Early in our conversation, it was established that I do not speak Georgian. The son saw the photo and affirmatively nodded and spoke in Georgian to the hostess briefly and then turned to me with a beaming smile and a thumbs up and said in English, Very pretty, you lucky brother. He then, in Russian, asked if I texted her to invite her. I lied and said I did text her, and reiterated that she was arriving in a few hours. It was around 4pm at the time, and a beautiful golden hour glow that lit up the surrounding mountains and valley. The son said he will join us, and asked if I liked cha-cha. Cha-cha is a very strong national liquor of Georgia, ranging from 30 to 75% alcohol content, and made from distilled grapes. I'd become quite the savant of cha-cha, and despite some strange feelings about their fixation on the female visitor, I obliged. Cha-cha is not for the weak-hearted, but I was very used to consuming it at the time. I should have paid more notice to the very intentional placement of the shots he filled for us, but I pushed those misgivings aside, and had the shot after a very traditional toast. Around twenty minutes later, I felt exhausted and ill, and excused myself to my room, saying I needed a quick nap. Walking to my room, I knew something was amiss. As mentioned in the beginning, I was fronting a questionable business, and I did have a firearm in my bag, and made a mental note to take it, and put it under my pillow, but as one can imagine, it isn't easy to remember things even on short term when apparently drugged. Despite failing to collect my weapon, I did close my blinds as the afternoon sun was blaring into the room, and I wanted darkness. Passing out at around 4.30pm, I awoke to darkness at 4.45am with a raging headache. My window shades were partially open despite me closing them before passing out. They were opened with about two feet of space visible to the outside. My bags were not in the position I left them, and the television was on and high volume despite me never using it, and the door was only partially closed. I peered out the window and didn't see anything, so I quickly went to my bag, retrieved my firearm, and went to the bathroom with the intention of calling my co-workers or a driver to pick me up. I had no cell service and no Wi-Fi despite having perfectly fine reception the day prior. 
I went back to bed with a weapon under the pillow with zero desire or inclination to fall back asleep. After an hour or so of pretending to be asleep, I saw the sun peer through the window to get a look inside. At this point, I was certain it was not my imagination playing tricks on me, and that I was in trouble. I came out around sunrise to find both the hostess and her son sipping tea on the deck, and told the hostess that my girlfriend was arriving soon on a bus, and that I'd bring her when it arrived. I grabbed my backpack and left my other bag to give the impression I wasn't fleeing, but service immediately after leaving the property, and called a partner to pick me up old-school businessman who was floating the money I'd run the lending operation with. I told him the story, and he said he would handle it. He did handle it. I still think about the foul-smelling hole the sun was digging. Last guest. Weeks later, I decided that wasn't the place for business for me, and applied to law school in the other side of the world. Being incredibly wigged out, I spent the following days at home being a recluse, likely giving my food delivery drivers good experiences to share on the internet. After fear buying an automatic rifle and the Georgian version of Craigslist, my marketage, and spooning in for a bit, I heard back from my colleague who was incredibly supportive through the whole clusterfuck that the situation was handled. The content of that conversation is private and will remain that way. In keeping with sharing only my personal experience and avoiding details, my conversation with my colleague when he came to speak with me resulted in heavy drinking, tears, references to his children, and the fact that the correct thing was done. 2. I live in France, and this story happened to me this summer, just after the lockdown ended. I was, and still am, 19. After the lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents to spend a few weeks. I got tested before and no problems there. My grandparents live in a small city in the north of France, and they have a dog who's quite big. When I was really young, I lived at my grandparents for a year, and at that time the dog was only a puppy. Her name is Chippy in French, which kind of means little devil in English, but in an affectionate way. Considering when I was living there, I played with her a lot. We were both really close, and that will have its importance later. Two of my hobbies are having long walks and running. Thus, every evening I was going out for a long walk with the dog. There's a track that follows a path through the forest. Then there's a small hill, and at the top of that, there's a big place with lots of fields there. I run there a lot, so I know the place. The air is fresh, and the view is quite beautiful. I was going there with the dog every day. It was also helping my grandparents to have her doing lots of exercise. The first time we went there, nothing special happened. We just enjoyed our walk. It's about six or seven kilometers, so basically an hour walk. The next day, when we arrived in the top of the hill in the field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was still some light because it's summer. There were three other people walking in the fields. They were younger than me, probably about 15 or 16. I noticed they were smoking, so my guess was that they came here so they wouldn't be seen by their parents. We went past them, I greeted them, and they greeted back. Once again, nothing special there. For all week I did this walk around the same time, 10pm, and passed by those three guys with nothing special happening, and it was perfectly fine to me this way. The second week, as usual, I went for a walk with Chippy, and arrived at the fields. There was only one of the three boys, who wasn't smoking this time though. When he saw me, I was at the entrance of the field just after the little hill climb, so the entrance of the forest was just behind me. He did a sign with his hand to catch my attention and asked if I had a lighter, which I actually had in my pocket and I told him, yeah, sure. So he walked to me, the hand in the pockets of his hoodie. When he came near, for some reason I felt a shiver. It's crazy how sometimes your instinct knows there's a problem, but you don't listen to it because nothing looks weird to you. I handed over the lighter when he passed by at that moment. My dog was staring at him. Then everything happened really fast. He did a really fast movement with his hand coming from the hoodie, and I only saw something shining. I just had a reflex of throwing myself back so hard that I fell down, and I just realized that it was a knife he was holding, and he had just tried to stab me. What saved me is my dog, God bless her. When she saw the guy trying to stab me, she jumped on him, and he fell down, 
as I said before, a really big dog. I immediately got up on my feet and heard something in my back. From the entrance of the forest, I saw two guys wearing animal masks running at me. They were probably the two friends. In this moment, you go on autopilot. You don't think at all, and in this case, the answer he found was really simple. The other guy was still on the ground. I watched my dog and told her to run. I started running and she followed me, but I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who got up as well. Catch him! Don't let him go! At this moment, I was totally terrified. I was just running, running. I was hearing them running behind me, only thinking, how long will they follow me? Who the hell are they? This was the first time I was really happy to be a runner. I was clearly better than those guys, and that totally saved me, because they chased for something that felt like an eternity to me. Fortunately, at the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest, and this time it descended with the road at the end. I heard the steps of the three guys vanishing as I arrived at the end of the forest. Well, I didn't stop running until I arrived at my grandparents' house and locked myself in. I caught a big breath and gave a huge hug to my dog. I saw in her eyes that she totally understood what happened, and I had never been so happy to have her in my life. After that, I told everything to my grandparents. We called the police, but they didn't find anyone. I don't know what those guys wanted, but the animal masks really made me think of some kind of Satanists. I really don't want to know anyway. I still do long walks with Chippy, the hero dog. But now I go earlier and to places with a little more people. Three. About five years ago, I was volunteering in a listening service that was only aimed at helping children up to 18 years of age. A lot of training was required for this role. Even though it was an anonymous phone service, if a child presented with a dangerous situation and we had their permission, then we could call the appropriate authorities, example, the police or social services. After a few weeks, I was feeling settled in and I had taken many calls. The majority were just kids joking around, but there were many tough calls too. Most evenings after I had finished my shift, I would feel so overcome with emotion that I would fight back tears on the way home in my car. Having a small child of my own often made it harder to forget about. One phone call in particular really startled me, and to this day I often think about it. It was about 9.45pm, 15 minutes before my shift ended, and I was sitting around. I hadn't taken a call for over an hour, and time seemed to be moving slowly. My phone rings, and a petite, soft female voice says, Hello? I introduce myself, giving a fake name, as I always do, and tell her a little bit about the service, and about what we do, and what we would do if someone's in danger. She says almost immediately, I need help, I'm babysitting my younger sister, she's only two months old and I'm nine, she's diabetic and turning blue, my mother and father have gone out, please help. I felt as though all my training had gone out the window, I was panicking, but I tried my best to keep my thoughts clear and my voice clear. Go outside and get help. Go and knock at a neighbor's house and call the nearest adult you see, I insisted. The little girl talked me through her steps and said she had a baby in her arms and was out in the street. Listening to the noise of the traffic and the sound of the night air, my heart was beating so fast, aching to know what was going on and feeling so helpless. I could hear the little girl speaking to someone, but I couldn't make out what was being said. Next of all, a lady came on the phone. I have them. Hello? Hello? I have them both. I'm going to take them to the nearest hospital. I thanked the lady and she told me that help was on the way. I ended the call and once I gathered myself, I informed my supervisor. She was as shocked as I was when I gave her all the details. She called the hospital in the area the girl had given me and she also called the police. After an hour of filling in the mandatory documents, my supervisor followed up the inquiry about the call we had received and they said they had no such cases. Finding it quite strange, we finished off writing the notes and shut down for the night. My next shift wasn't until the following week, which I was grateful for. I needed the time off. When I returned after my week off, my supervisor called me into her office and informed me that she had gone through my notes on the call I received and had gone and searched the system for similar scenarios and keywords. 
She told me that every caller has a profile, and that the girl who called was a frequent caller, and she wasn't a little girl, but a lady in her thirties in a psychiatric hospital, and she liked to pose as different people, but mostly as a child. This creeped me out considering the nature of the service and the fact that an adult was abusing the service. This information angered me and also disturbed me. I felt silly and naive as I had believed this girl's story. Over the next few months, she called a few more times under different descriptions and always posing as a vulnerable person. I wasn't there for much longer, but that story always gives me the creeps when I think about it. Four. My friend Sally has had a bad run-in with neighbors, but this was one of the worst. Sally lives very close to me, about a ten-minute walk, and we were both around fourteen years old when this happened. We live rural, so we both have a lot of land. Me and Sally decided to go camping on her land. We bought cheap hammocks and went through the bushland. The days prior, we spent clearing some of the razor grass with a cane knife to make a path. We probably should have worn long pants because we ended up with little cuts all over our legs and some on our arms. We set up our hammocks and brought quite a few blankets because it does get pretty cold at night, even though you're sweating throughout the day. We were still on her property and hadn't gone to her neighbor's boundary. Her neighbor had just leased the land to new tenants. Me and Sally were sitting on our hammocks, talking and laughing. This was around 9pm. We heard something in the bush. We just thought it was a wallaby. There's plenty of wallabies around there. Then we could see the figure of a man. We were whispering to each other, trying to see who it was. At first we thought it was her brother. He's come and scared us while we were camping previously. Then, as the person got closer, we were thinking it could have been her dad. It was dark and the bush looked the same from every angle. We realized the man was coming from the other direction than her house. We didn't dare move and covered our torches under our blankets. The man came up and said hi and introduced himself as Ben. Now Ben was extremely drunk. He staggered around and he reeked of alcohol. He started saying how we had a nice little camp here and said something pretty unsettling. I'll have to come out and sunbathe naked here in one of these hammocks. Me and Sally gave each other worried looks but didn't say anything. It only got worse from there. I can't remember everything he said because it was a little while ago and he was mumbling on for what felt like forever. But some of the things that stuck out were I have to kill you as Wolf Creek style and You're nearly legal then. When he asked us our age. Ben was probably in his forties. Me and Sally were texting each other while he was talking and coming up with an escape plan. He also offered us a puff on the magic dragon and pulled out a glass pipe, we declined. Sally said that we were leaving back to the house to make food. He told us to come back, we left our blankets and most of the stuff there and legged it. We told her dad what happened and we slept inside. The next morning we went back out to the campsite to find everything burnt. A circle with probably a 20 meter radius was all burnt. Coming from that circle was a line of burnt grass going towards the neighbor's house. I'm not a firefighter or do forensics, but it seemed obvious that some kind of fuel was used. Me and Sally were talking and it dawned on us the possibility that Ben may have thought we were in the hammocks due to the pile of blankets. Ben was definitely drunk enough not to be able to tell the difference. We went and told Sally's dad who then checked it out and then went next door. Ben's roommate answered the door and said Ben wasn't home and apologized and even gave Sally's dad $50 for the blankets and hammocks. Nothing more happened for a few months. Sally told me at school about how Ben had been caught on camera sneaking around her yard. I went to her house after school because she was going to be home alone until her dad finished work. I ended up sleeping over there that night. That's when he came over. Ben was drunk and came out the front of Sally's house and started yelling. He accused Sally of stealing his dog. Sally's dad called the police. They arrested him. The next day we found a knife in the yard. It wasn't from Sally's house. The police came again and we told them about the knife, and they got the footage from the cameras as well. I don't know what happened to Ben, but he no longer lives next to Sally. So Ben, let's never meet again.
Hey everybody, Hal Fraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Four True Scary Stories, episode number three. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I always have to stop myself when I'm when I'm doing the intros there to the intros to the outros, the intros to the outros. I suppose every outro has an intro, and it technically has an outro as well. Okay, let's not go down that road. We could go on forever. But anyway, yeah, because I'm just so used to doing the three scary stories. But, um, four it is this week, but it would have been too short otherwise. So, four stories instead. Uh, glad to say the guy came to replace the smoke alarms today. Uh, it wasn't too late, but it did mean kind of a disruption to my day. Uh, which is why when this video originally goes up, it's actually going up late. Uh, if you're not watching it that day, it wouldn't really matter, because... It doesn't really matter, but you know, if you're expecting it to go up at 7 p.m., it's probably going up closer to. Well, it's currently 8:30 as I'm recording this, so it won't be up by night. It's probably going to be 10 p.m. at the latest, uh, but at least it's within the day, I suppose. Okay, enough grumbles from me. I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.